Chapter 297 The Indian Maidservant and the Old Saudi Man, Part 7 Rehana Khan narrated her story without fear or favor, neither adding nor omitting anything that she could remember of her ordeal. She related her kidnapping, her beatings and her rape at the hands of the two Saudi police officers. She described how her daughter had found the kind Bedouin family that saved both of them and invited them to live with them in their home. Finally, she spoke of the Good Samaritan, Aslam Ali Khan, a kind and caring Muslim man who had saved them from the streets and more beatings and imprisonment. She neglected to mention the marriage of convenience. When she was done, Sheikh Ahmed thanked Allah for using this kind Bedouin family and the good Indian man in helping his maidservant and her little daughter. While the chauffeur was racing toward home, Sheikh Ahmed remembered his Friday obligatory prayer. A glance at his watch revealed only 15 minutes to prayer time. He decided he should go pray. He wanted to go the house of Allah and thank him for finally bringing his beloved woman to him. Muslims consider every mosque in the world to be the house of Allah. Moreover, Muhammad claimed that Allah has given him the entire earth planet as mosque. Following this promise, Muslims want to build mosques everywhere even in Ground Zero. Once again, Sheikh Ahmed set off a new round of orders to his chauffeur, reminding him to make haste. As the car pulled up to the entrance of the mosque, he got out and instructed his chauffeur to take Rehana and her daughter to the house of his fourth wife. Sheikh Ahmed would not dare to take Rehana and her daughter with him to the mosque because that is strictly forbidden. Prophet Muhammad discouraged women from attending the mosque. Sheikh Ahmed had four houses and four wives. In each house, he had children, servants, animals, one wife, and two washrooms. It is imperative that each Muslim's house must have two separate washrooms, men, women. All four of his wives were older than Rehana. The fourth wife and the youngest was a 45-year-old divorcee. He had married her the only divorcee in his harem, because she was the daughter of a very wealthy Saudi. When they arrived at Sheikh Ahmed's house, the chauffeur came around quickly and opened the door for Rehana. He then stretched out his arms to Ifat, she reached up, and he carried her out of the car. This act of kindness was not lost as Rehana observed how he was carrying her daughter. From the time they met, Rehana liked his friendly nature. The only thing that marred her impression of him was a remark he made after the sheikh had exited the car. He commented Sheikh Ahmed loved her so much he couldn't think straight, and if she was smart, she could make more money than she could count. His remark disturbed Rehana and she was quick to respond that she was not interested in making money in that way. She also reminded him that Sheikh Ahmed was old enough to be her grandfather. After Rehana's sharp remarks, the Pakistani decided he had better keep his opinions to himself. A seed of suspicion however was now planted in Rehana's mind, and she thought there had to be a reason the old Saudi must have gone to such great lengths to hire her and maybe it was more than her good looks and because she was Muslim. Upon reaching the house of wife number four, she consciously dismissed what her mind was slow to acknowledge. Their arrival at the front gate was greeted by a very dark-skinned night guard wielding the muzzle of a machine gun and a large dog. The guard was a Sudanese and he appeared to Rehuna as if he had colored his face and hands with black paint. Rehuna and her daughter began to tremble when they saw the guard and the large dog. The chauffeur saw the fear in their eyes and told the guard to take his dog aside. The guard held his dog back until the chauffeur took Rehuna and her daughter inside the house. As soon as they stepped inside the compound, Rehana saw a woman standing halfway between the gate and the house. She was tall and slender and her face was somewhat contorted. With her arms on her hips, she looked as though she was ready to put up a fight. The chauffeur approached the woman and greeted her politely in Arabic, Good afternoon Mrs. Ahmed. The angry woman remained silent. Madam. This is your new maidservant, Rehana Khan, and this is her daughter Ifat. Rehana noticed the woman's face had an angry look. She started to feel like she wasn't going to have an easy time working there in the house of her sponsor's wife. She was going to have to deal with a lion masquerading as a dog, a demon-like guard, and a woman mean as a cobra. Where have you come from? 
Mrs. Ahmed asked angrily. Immediately, the chauffeur resumed his translator role, giving Rehuna her first conversation with the woman of the house. India. What kind of work have you come to do here? Anything you want me to do, I will do for you madam. Mrs. Ahmed already had been informed by her husband about the new maid servant. Sheikh Ahmed called her while they were on their way back from the beauty salon and informed her about the new maid servant. Follow me, said Mrs. Ahmed. Rehuna and her daughter followed the woman while the Pakistani driver remained stationary. The woman stopped, turned her back, and shouted at the chauffeur to come with them. Following a few steps behind the tall Arab woman, Rehuna began to admire the beauty of the large house. As they passed through the opulent rooms, Rehuna hoped that she and her daughter might be given one of those rooms to stay in. They continued to walk until they reached the last room. Entering the room, Rehuna recognized the room to be the kitchen. Mrs. Ahmed took her station in the middle of the kitchen and placed her hands on her hips. She pivoted around to face Rehuna and began listing her instructions when she discovered something about Rehuna, which had escaped her earlier. Where were you before you came here? shouted the woman angrily. I was in the beauty salon, answered Rehuna frankly. So, he took you to the beauty salon before you came here. Before Rehuna could respond, Mrs. Ahmed shot off a new round of questions. Where is your luggage? Where is your daughter's bag? We have no bags and we have no clothes madam. How did you travel all the way from India to Saudi Arabia without clothing or luggage? Rehuna remained silent and the chauffeur decided it would be best to keep silent. So, my husband met you on the street and decided to hire you as a maidservant. He then took you to the beauty salon before sending you here. Madam, your husband met me in Bombay. He asked me to come to his country and work as his maidservant. Some bad men stole my bag and belongings when my daughter and I arrived in the city. Well, I will talk to my husband and find out more about you when he gets home. Right now, I want to give you your cleaning instructions. First of all, you must know that I am a very strict woman. I hate dirtiness and filthiness and I detest immoral behavior. Mrs. Ahmed paused and surveyed Rehuna from top to bottom. She raised her voice even louder with no attempt to disguise her hot temper. Her voice resounded against the walls and it was as though she was crying inside, First, you must know there are males living in the household. I have two sons and my husband. One son is 16 years old and the other is 14 years old. They are good children and are doing well in their studies. If I perceive any immoral behavior on your part, I will beat you and wipe your face on the ground. I know you are not an ugly woman and you might try to use your beauty to entice the good men in my house. I didn't like your face from the moment I laid eyes on you. If any man in this house smiles at you, you are not to smile back. If he calls you to come to his room do not enter. Keep yourself at a distance from them. I will never tolerate any kind of love affair between any one of the noble men in this house and a lowly servant. If I happen to leave the house for any reason, don't be surprised if I lock you up in your room and keep you confined. Okay, madam. Now, we will go over the rules and your duties in this house. Mrs. Ahmed eased herself into a chair and crossed her legs at the knees. The briefing began. She did not tell Rehuna or her daughter to sit. Even the chauffeur was standing on his feet while translating the conversation between the noble Saudi woman and her new maid servant. Rule number one. You have to be in the kitchen from six o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night. Rule number two. You are not allowed to sit on any chair, stool, or couch during working hours. You are also to neither watch TV nor listen to the radio during working hours. Rule number three. You have to cook and prepare the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, wash the clothes, bed sheets, pillow covers, and the tablecloths. You will clean all of the dishes and other utensils, sweep and mop the rooms and hallways, water the plants, iron the clothes, and do whatever else I require. 
After she finished telling her new maidservant the rules and regulations, the noble Arab woman went to every room in her mansion and gathered all the clothes, bed sheets, mattress and pillow covers, tablecloths, etc., and then ordered Rehuna to commence her work. When Rehuna entered the women's washroom and saw the huge pile of clothes and linens, she reasoned within herself that if she worked continuously without let-up, she would not be able to finish half of the laundry even in a week's time. When she used to work in the homes of the rich families in India, no family had ever asked her to wash such a large heap of clothes and linens at one time. In most Indian homes in Bombay, the rich people had washing machines that made it easy for Rehuna to wash their clothes and linens. Mrs. Ahmed had no washing machine. There were only two oversized sinks and she expected her new maidservant to use her bare hands to wash the entire stockpile of dirty clothes and laundry. When Rehuna protested, the noblewoman threatened to kick her out of the house at once and never allow her to set her foot back in again. Rehuna brought her daughter inside the washroom with her and asked her to sit nearby as she reluctantly began washing the mounds and mounds of soiled laundry. She washed non-stop for three hours. Then through her interpreter, Mrs. Ahmed came and ordered her to the kitchen to start preparing dinner for the family. Rehuna felt a great weight lifted off her shoulders. She got up immediately and headed towards the kitchen followed by her little Ifit. When she reached the kitchen, she noticed a big tray with many dishes and plates. In every step of the dinner preparation Mrs. Ahmed was screaming at Rehuna. Twenty minutes were wasted in rebuking, correcting and shoving Rehuna for her many errors and mistakes. Then, the noblewoman told Rehuna to wait for five minutes and bring the dinner tray to the dining hall. Mrs. Ahmed felt it was below her dignity to be seen by her husband and two sons walking with a lower-than-dirt Indian maidservant. Waiting for her five minutes to pass, Rehuna tried to straighten the kitchen. The three hours in the washroom had left her with a bad pain in her back. Hunched over, she carried the heavy tray to the dining hall. The weight of the tray aggravated her back and caused her to bend forward in posture. Her position was particularly appealing to the males of the household. If she approached them, they would be able to see her two healthy breasts clearly through the opening of her dress. If she turned toward them, they could see her dress accentuating her hips and buttocks from the wetness of washing clothes and dishes. It was the maidservant's good fortune that all these revealing temptations escaped the attention of this very strict Muslim woman or she would have been beaten mercilessly. While waiting for their meal in the dining hall, Sheikh Ahmed, his noble wife, and their two teenage sons were seated at the table. The children sat side by side, facing their parents. How is your new maidservant coming along? asked Sheikh Ahmed. I am not happy to have her here in this house, Mrs. Ahmed replied. What is wrong with her? She is young and strong. Surely she is going to be a great help to you. I am not worried about her strength or her age. I don't like her face. What did you say Mama? shouted the sixteen-year-old son, have you brought an ugly face into the house again? Papa, please tell me you didn't get another maidservant that looks like a monkey. I am still getting nightmares just thinking about that last ugly maidservant you brought to work here. I do not believe that that ugly girl is gone, said the fourteen-year-old. Where are you getting them from? The zoo? The first one looked like a chimpanzee, the second like a dog, the third like a monkey, and this one I am sure will look like a gorilla, said the older son. Why don't you just get a girl with a normal human face, said the youngest son. Why do you always bring maidservants from Africa? Can you just once time get an Arab maidservant or someone from a country like Lebanon or Egypt? Hisham and Husam, shouted the noble woman, I am your mother and I know what's best for you. I chose the previous maidservants but this time your father has chosen a maidservant and I don't like her face because it doesn't qualify her to be a maidservant. Before the sons could pry their mother further with questions, the new maidservant entered the dining hall. They first saw the big tray, followed by a face that obviously impressed them. 
Their eyes were fixated on each step she made and they were staring at her face and breasts. By the time the new maidservant made it to the table, the young boys were on their feet. Hisham, the first to recover his composure, rushed behind her to pull up a chair, gesturing for her to sit. He sneaked a glance at her backside and felt an electric rush of excitement run up his spine. By the time he noticed the wet dress clinging to her buttocks, he was sporting an erection. His brother reached out to relieve her of the huge food tray and repeated the gesture for the maidservant to sit down. The maidservant understood this kind consideration and gladly sat in the chair. Hoping to gain favors with the new maidservant, the brother then proceeded to pile a plate full of food and offer it to her. The mother became fed up and could not stand it anymore. She went from irritated to furious. ''Get up you stupid girl!'' screamed Mrs. Ahmed. You are here to serve us and not to be served by us. Have I not told you that your place is in the kitchen? How dare you sit here at this table? Rahana had not understood one single word but jumped out of her chair as if she had heard the hissing and rattling of a rattlesnake beneath her seat. She didn't need to know Arabic to interpret her mistress meant business and she instantly flew headlong into the kitchen. Have I not told you, Sheikh Ahmed? that this girl is not suitable as a maidservant? You can see with your own eyes the effect of her face on your sons. If you want to destroy their good manners, then let her stay here. Mastera, said Mr. Ahmed, this woman is a poor Muslim Indian. She met me in Bombay and begged me to help her to come to Saudi Arabia and work as a maidservant in my house. She is widowed and has no one except her little daughter. Then. Don't blame me if she corrupts your sons. Mama, how can she corrupt us? She looks so innocent, said Hisham. Yes, Hisham is right. She looks like an angel, said Hugh Sam. How do you know what an angel looks like? Have you seen an angel before? asked the mother. No, Mama, but today I think I have. See, they have started calling her an angel and tomorrow they will be calling her darling. They are just teasing you my wife. I know they are good boys and they know their limits. Mama, we will treat her as our sister. You are a good boy, son, said Mr. Sheik to Hugh Sam. I will hold you entirely responsible if anything wrong happens in this house because of this woman. I am certain that nothing bad will happen. To be beautiful is not a crime. The last words of Sheikh Ahmed caused his wife to get up from the table without eating her dinner. She then went into the kitchen. There she found the new maidservant sitting with her daughter eating a meal. In a short time, Rehana had developed a petrifying fear of this noble and righteous Muslim woman. Whenever she saw her or heard the voice of the cobra woman, she felt the evil of demons and jinn trying to possess her soul. The hairs of her body would bristle up and she would shake uncontrollably inside. Mrs. Ahmed screamed at her maidservant in Arabic. Rehana did not understand but she dashed up and ran to the washroom leaving her daughter in the kitchen. She resumed washing the stacks of laundry and after about an hour, the cobra woman came and grabbed her by her hand and dragged her back to the kitchen. She pointed at the dirty dishes. Rehana understood and began cleaning them. After she finished cleaning the dishes, the cobra returned, grabbed her by the wrist and took her back to the washroom. In stone silence, Rehana spent many hours again washing in the washroom until the flesh of her hands were white and numb. Her daughter fell asleep nearby. It was 10.30 p.m. when Rehana finished washing and left the washroom. With another crick in her back, she carried her sleeping daughter but she was not able to stand up straight. Her back was completely bent over. Her feet felt as though the arches had completely fallen flat and her head was dizzy. Her stomach was empty and she felt nauseous. She wasn't able to stand without supporting herself against the wall. The weight of her daughter made it almost impossible to walk. Nevertheless, the cobra woman appeared like a haint out of nowhere and confronted her just outside the washroom. She took hold of her hand and began to drag her toward a storeroom. Rehana then understood that the storeroom was to be her room. Without saying good night or uttering a word, 
the noble Muslim woman locked the door of the small storeroom where there was no way out. She left Rehana and her daughter bedded down in the comfort of home to face a horrible night with rats, cockroaches, lizards, and mosquitoes. Rehana could feel the movement of the venomous viper fading away into the distance. Looking around her new dwelling, she noticed broken furniture, old toys and some unidentifiable equipment. It was very small and had a foul odor. On top of it was a dimly lit light. The rats and mosquitoes were making enough noise to awaken dead persons in their graves. Rehana wasn't bothered about the mosquitoes because her slum was full of them, but she had a morbid fear of rats. She believed that rats eat human flesh if they were hungry enough. There was one small single bed. She lay her sleeping daughter onto the bed and sat beside her to keep watch. She found a knob and switched off the dim light. The small room had no windows. Wherefore, as soon as she switched off the light, the room became as dark as a tomb. With her fear of rats magnifying, she put her legs upon the bed. From sheer fright, she dared not let her legs down. Despite fatigue, she fought to stay awake but lost the battle quickly, falling asleep beside her daughter as if she had been drugged. 